Hello, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about flow-directed embolic agents. I do like to begin talks on embolic agents speaking briefly about the classification of embolic agents because I think it's an important way to gauge your understanding of these agents, such as how they work, why they work, and what we might use them for. I generally like to divide embolic agents into mechanical devices and flow-directed devices, which include particulate agents and liquid and gels. The indications for flow-directed embolic agents are many and include, among others, the uterine fibroid embolization procedure, prostatic artery embolization, geniculate embolization, bronchial artery embolizations for patients with hemoptysis, embolization of angiomyelipomas, or preoperative embolizations of various tumors. A lot of what we do in interventional oncology falls into this category, such as classic taste, bland embolization, or radioembolization. And there are certainly several other indications in which it would be appropriate to use a flow-directed embolic agent. PVA particles represent the standard for particulate embolic agents. And I think we all know that there has been an increase in usage of spherical embolic agents for many of the indications I listed, and this has pushed particulate PVA to the back of the shelf. But everyone should know that it remains a very effective embolic agent. Polyvinyl alcohol itself has several non-medical applications. It's used in the textile industry and the cleaning supply industry, as well as, a, as well as the adhesive products such as Elmer's glue and postage stamps. There are also several medical applications to PVA, including surgical sponges, wound dressings, surgical cavity packings, and of course, embolic agents. The first step in manufacturing PVA is the generation of formalized PVA, and this means adding formaldehyde to PVA to generate this form of PVA. The microstructure of PVA can actually be controlled in order to set pore size and wall thickness, and this is done before the conversion to formalized PVA. This can affect particle compressibility, suspension, and microcatheter compatibility. Once the formalized PVA is created, that sponge is converted to particles, and this is done through a grinding process. Once the particles are created, they're passed through a series of sieves with sequentially smaller holes, which separates them into different particle size preparations. And this is what we're used to seeing in our angio suites, where the manufacturers of particulate PVA separate and package the PVA into vials of different size ranges. Once we prepare to use PVA, our goal is to reduce the tendency of these particles to aggregate, and we do that with appropriate dilution. In our lab, we typically prepare PVA with a 20 ml syringe. The first step is drawing up about 10 cc's of normal saline. We then remove the plunger of the syringe and pour in the particulate PVA that we want to use. Following that, we replace the plunger and then we draw up an equivalent amount of contrast. Usually it creates a 20 cc solution with one vial of PVA suspended within it. Initially, when we inject PVA into the vessel, it adheres to the vessel wall and causes slow flow without complete occlusion. Slow flow leads to inflammatory and foreign body reactions that ultimately cause clot to form in between the particles. And this is followed by an inflammatory reaction and vessel remodeling. PVA itself is a permanent embolic agent because it's not biodegradable. However, the occlusion that's caused by the use of PVA may or may not be permanent. Temporary occlusions can occur, and these can last for months or even years. Distal migration, fragmentation, or even extravascular migration of PVA particles can occur. The thrombus that forms in between the PVA particles within the lumen of the embolized vessel can become resorbed. And finally, angioneogenesis and capillary regrowth caused by vascular proliferation inside the organized thrombus can lead to a temporary occlusion as well. There are cases, however, where the PVA-based um, occlusion is permanent. And in this case, the occlusion is due to the organization of thrombus and ingrowth of connective tissue into the particles, which results in fibrosis.
One interesting discussion about particulate PVA are the very well-established issues that are known to occur with this agent. First off, there's size variability, and this is just a manifestation of the manufacturing process. This is what PVA particles look like under a microscope, and, and it should be immediately evident that these particles are of different shapes, configurations, and sizes. And the problem is that this may allow larger particles to pass through small holes depending on the orientation of the particle as it passes through the sieves. For example, take a look at one of these particles in the upper right hand portion of the image. I think you can see that if a particle passes through one way, it's going to go through different size holes than if it passes through the other way. This can lead to vials of certain size ranges that actually have a markedly larger size variability than what's, than what's on the packaging. And you can see on, on this diagram, on this graph, look at the red and the green lines on the graph, and you can see that a particle uh, size range of 500 to 710 microns actually may include particles that are smaller than 500 microns and particles that are almost as large as 2,000 microns. When you have this kind of size variability within a vial of PVA, it means that some of those particles may travel more distal or lodge more proximal than intended, and this can affect the level of occlusion within the target vessel. Microcatheter occlusion is another potential issue when using particulate PVA. And we definitely know from experience that this can happen. It's likely related to particle size, poor particle suspension in the saline and contrast mixture, and particle aggregation, which is actually the third well-established issue with particulate PVA. We know that PVA particles tend to clump together once they're administered. And I like to use the analogy of jigsaw puzzle pieces. If you look at the PVA particles on the left, it's not too hard to imagine them finding ways to group together and become more aggregated, much like a perfectly sized and, and configured jigsaw puzzle pieces. This is a problem because we always think about the desired level of occlusion when determining the particle size for a given procedure. We count on the fact that small particles will lead to a more distal occlusion than larger particles. If the particles aggregate, then this renders the effective size of the particles larger than their actual size. And besides causing microcatheter occlusion, this can lead to a false angiographic endpoint and an occlusion that's more proximal than intended. So it's these problems, size variability, microcatheter occlusion, and particle aggregation, which led to the development of embolic microspheres. So embosphere microspheres were the first commercially available embolic microsphere, and they were developed in direct response to the problems I outlined with particulate PVA. Embospheres are precisely calibrated acrylic beads that are embedded with porcine gelatin. They have a cationic charge, which makes them hydrophilic and non-aggregating. Catheter clogging is therefore not an issue. And the manufacturing process separates the microspheres into subgroups with a much narrower size range than we see with particular PVA. And in the case of embospheres, that size range is usually plus or minus 100 microns. Because they don't aggregate, for a given particle and vessel size, embospheres tend to penetrate to a much greater extent, or they travel more distally to a greater extent than particulate PVA. Pathologically, the occlusion that we see with embospheres is attributed to the space-occupying nature of the microspheres. Little to no thrombus is seen within vessels embolized with embospheres. The other interesting thing is that these spheres tend to travel to size-matched vessels, and this can lead to vessel wall destruction and can even cause extravascular migration of these microspheres, and this has been reported. Following the introduction of embosphere microspheres, there have been several other microspheres which have been developed and are commercially available. Embosine microspheres are another available embolic microsphere. In the case of embosine, the core material is made of a hydrogel consisting of polymethyl methacrylate, known as PMMA. And once the PMMA microspheres are made, they undergo hydrolysis, which makes them hydrophilic.
that process actually allows a shell to be added to the hydrogel core. And this shell is made of polyzine F. The thickness is quite small, about 30 nanometers, and it's a proprietary material made mostly of phosphorus and nitrogen atoms. When embosine is used, the occluding plug in the embolized vessel consists mostly of the embolic agent alone with only a small degree of thrombocene, which is similar to embospheres. However, in this particular case, embolization is not associated with disruption of the vessel wall, and there's been no evidence of microsphere extravasation when these spheres are used. The microspheres initiate a foreign body reaction characterized by acute infiltration of phagocytic cells. What's interesting about embazine is that over time there can be degradation of the outer shell, and this can prolong the foreign body reaction. This degradation may be due to inflammatory cells which have infiltrated the polymer core, which were degraded by the chemical hydrolysis process that I mentioned earlier. As a result, embazine microspheres are deformed more than embosphere microspheres within target vessels. So the level of occlusion is determined more by this, this deformation than by the package size. Embospheres don't deform as much, so the level of vessel occlusion is determined more by the package size than anything else. Given these findings, a targeted embolization with embosphere microspheres may be more difficult to achieve since the actual site of occlusion may be unpredictable. Those of you that have used this product know that the, the, they look different than others. The package sizing for these microspheres is marked by a single size. The variability ranges from 10 to 75 microns based on the package size. And this range is usually plus or minus 50 microns for the most commonly used sizes, which are 250 to 700 microns. Another available agent um, are bead block microspheres. These microspheres are made of a PVA hydrogel that's cross-linked with an acrylic polymer. They're tinted blue through the use of contact lens technology so that we can better see them. And they do tend to be more compressible than embospheres. In fact, they're, they're known to compress to approximately 30% of the original diameter and therefore travel to vessels that are smaller in size than the package size. And this was confirmed with an animal study which showed that these microspheres penetrate deeper into the target vessel bed than similarly sized embospheres. I also just want to briefly mention the newest um, bland microsphere, which is are the hydropearl microspheres. These are polyethylene glycol-based microspheres, and a lot of the information that I presented about the previous agents are just not available yet for these microspheres. So let's talk about the preparation and delivery of these microspheres. As with particulate PVA, we need to make sure that the microspheres are well suspended when we administer them. And suspension time actually defines the injection period before the physician using them has to resuspend the microspheres. And that time is impacted by relative density, osmolality, and viscosity of the microspheres and the suspending medium. Appropriate suspension is important because it helps avoid aggregation. Now clearly this is more of an issue with particulate PVA than with microspheres. That smooth surface of the microsphere and their hydrophilic nature help resist aggregation, but it, it does not eliminate that risk. A cluster of microspheres can still potentially occlude the microcatheter and even be responsible for a more proximal embolization than intended. The suspension process can also help avoid microsphere fragmentation. Fatigue can lead to fragmentation, and this will intuitively lead to smaller spheres, which potentially lead to a more distal embolization. And it's important to remember that when you're suspending the microspheres between two syringes and a stopcock. You don't want to be too aggressive during that process. I think it's important for anybody using these microspheres to understand the differences between the products because that's going to help you understand how to optimize their use for embolization procedures. Obviously, all of these microspheres occlude vessels effectively. The question really is where in the target vascular bed is this occlusion going to occur? And this is what you need to know in order to select an appropriate agent to treat a specific indication. The level of occlusion is generally impacted by the size, 
rigidity, and elasticity of the microspheres. In terms of size, we have gone over this. Each microsphere type is packaged within a given size range, so just always remember that there's a range that falls outside of the packaged size. In terms of rigidity, it's important for these microspheres to have some degree of compressibility and deformability because that's needed to allow them to pass through the delivery microcatheter. It may, however, become a negative attribute if the deformed microspheres can travel to vessels smaller than their baseline size. As a result, elasticity is something we also have to take into consideration. This is the ability of a microsphere to recover its original size after it's been compressed. If the microsphere deforms while passing through a microcatheter, it's the elasticity which will help predict the level of occlusion. If the elasticity is poor, the level of occlusion will be more unpredictable since those spheres will likely travel more distally than expected. There are both extrinsic forces and intrinsic characteristics which influence the rigidity and elasticity of a microsphere. The extrinsic forces include the injection pressure and friction with the catheter wall as the microspheres pass through the catheter. In addition, the blood pressure and friction forces within the vessel wall can occur as they pass through the target vascular bed, and this can influence the microspheres as well. The intrinsic characteristics that have a role in this include the degree of cross-linking, the hydrophilic nature of the polymer backbone of each microsphere, superficial tension, and the presence of ionic charges. Lewis studied this characteristic of microspheres in 2006. He looked at this in three different microspheres, embosphere microspheres, bead block, and contour SE microspheres, which are PVA-based microspheres. And he looked specifically at compressibility and found that embosphere was the most rigid of the three beads, followed closely by bead block. Contour SE was very compressible, and this is felt to have led to some of the um, less than idealized results associated with this microsphere, which is why you can't find it around anymore. Hidaki looked deeper at rigidity and elasticity. He studied embospheres, bead block, and embosine and found that embosphere was the most rigid, which confirmed Lewis's findings, and it was the least compressible of the three microspheres. Bead block was intermediate, and embosine was the least rigid, or the most compressible. And this is felt to be due to the PMMA hydrolysis that's take, that takes place during preparation. This group also looked at the viscoelasticity of the microspheres and found that embazine has a low resistance to compression but a high viscosity, which means they take more time to return to their original dimensions after being stressed. And in this particular case, bead block was similar to embosphere. So based on, on their observations, this group felt that for a given size, embosine should occlude more distally than the other two microspheres. And this was validated about two years later in a study that found that embosine had a higher in vivo deformation rate and a much more distal location than embospheres. So finally, the question for most interventionalists is how do you take all of this information and know which size of which particle should be used in a given clinical situation? I do believe that for every indication for embolization, there is a correct particle size which will get to the correct place and result in the best clinical outcome possible. The problem is that there's no universal table or chart that can be prepared to answer this question for every conceivable clinical situation. But I do think there's a thought process that can be followed to help you make the decision as to which microsphere should be used for a given clinical problem. And this involves considering clinical data, pathologic findings, and material characteristics. We have spent a lot of time talking about the material characteristics of these agents. If you're comparing PVA with microspheres, you should always think about using a smaller particulate PVA size due to the particle aggregation. You can consider a small size microsphere if you're trying to target distal vessels, and consider a larger size microsphere if the one you're choosing to use is more compressible or has less elastic recovery.
I think from a pathologic perspective, it's always best to know the size of the target vessels when selecting an agent for embolization. A specifically sized microsphere can end up in a specifically sized vessel if you select that appropriately. And that is, of course, keeping the material characteristics of that particular embolic in mind. The problem is that we don't always know the size of the vessels that we're targeting. And I like to say that that technology has advanced beyond our ability to always take advantage of it. And finally, there's the clinical data. And this is how we usually select an embolic agent. If there's a paper or papers that show us that a specifically sized agent leads to certain clinical outcomes, then that typically is what we choose to use for a given procedure. It's probably best to understand the pathology that we're treating and the vessels that we're targeting before selecting an embolic agent. Understanding the material characteristics of that agent will certainly help determine the most appropriate size for that pathology. Clinical outcomes are important as well, and I think that they often serve as a surrogate for the pathological information that we don't yet know or don't yet understand. So in conclusion, particulate embolization is an evolving area of embolization with new products and new indications being developed all the time, and I'm going to focus on, on those in later lectures. It's best to have a good understanding of the products you'll be using for these procedures because it's best for the patients and it will certainly help distinguish you from your competition.